Welcome to this SCORE webinar. Uh, this is the first in a series on ownership design uh, provided through SCORE Mentors Green Bay. So again, thanks for joining us. My name is Lori Hack. I am both a SCORE mentor in Green Bay um, and I'm also a small business owner. Um, I'm gonna be your host today and I'm really pleased to be here. So our goals today are to explain a range of ownership options um, and to highlight small business owners in doing so. So all of the panelists joining us today are small business owners um, from across the United States. Um, we're also going to take a little bit of time at the beginning to introduce you to the SCORE Mentors Program if you don't know about it already. Um, and one of the reasons that we are uh, recording this is to create resources to support you and your small business and thinking about your ownership options. As I mentioned, this webinar is the first in a series. We have three other things coming up. The first one, as I mentioned, is design overview today. Uh, we have an employee ownership webinar coming up on September 13th, and Ann Vandehei, who we'll meet in a minute, will be one of our speakers there. We do have another one on cooperative ownership coming up on the 21st of September, and one on Dow hybrids coming up on October 5th, where we'll have another one of our speakers joining us. Oh, and if you would like to learn more about these, please Join at SCORE Mentors Green Bay on Facebook, Twitter, and or LinkedIn, and we will be sharing uh, more information about the upcoming uh, webinars in the coming weeks. I would like to thank SCORE Green Bay for their sponsorship of this event, um, as well as Mighty Red Barn, and also the sponsorship of the Small Business Administration, um, which has been um, an affiliate of, of um, not affiliated, it's affiliated with uh, the SCORE program. So thank you for the sponsorship. I'm gonna take the next two or three minutes to talk a bit about what SCORE is, but I do want to acknowledge with people on from Northeast Wisconsin, from St. Louis, and from Marinette, which is also Northeast Wisconsin and Green Bay. So thank you all for joining us today. A little bit about SCORE. Uh, SCORE was formed in 1964 as a resource partner of the Small Business Administration. We provide one-on-one -on -one video, in-person email, and phone mentoring to small businesses across the United States. Um, we also provide live online and in-person workshops, much like this one, um, yeah, generally at no cost. And there's also uh, a huge SCORE online library of articles, blogs, and checklists, and templates that are available for the community free of charge. So if you're interested in learning more about SCORE, you can go to score.org. We have uh, over, you know, many, many thousands of volunteers nationwide, people like me and Anne. We've helped thousands of businesses get started, um, created many, you know, through those businesses, helped to create many thousands of jobs, and also helping clients, again, across the United States in over 1,500 communities. And we like to say that we help people achieve their goals and live their dreams. And hopefully some of the folks on the call today can talk about their dreams as well. So there's two pieces to SCORE. One, as we call our clients, these are the people who come to SCORE with questions. And uh, for anybody else, you don't have to go it alone. SCORE mentors, experienced folks in business can help out. And we're here for the life of your business, whether you're first thinking about setting something up um, or um, if you're well along the way and want a little bit of help with how do I do inventory management, for example. The interesting factoid here is that folks who come and receive more than you know three or more hours of mentoring do have report higher revenues and increased business growth. So getting the mentoring is can be very, very helpful. If you're interested in finding a mentor, the link is down here. You can go to www.score.org and click on the find a mentor button, which is near the top of the page. And you can search mentor by region or by skill set. In addition to SCORE clients, we also have SCORE volunteers like myself. We are always looking for people who are interested in giving back to the community. So if you're passionate about entrepreneurship and uh, uh, intrigued and inspired by the SCORE mission, please consider joining us as a SCORE volunteer. We have lots and lots of volunteer opportunities. And for this, you can go to score.org and there's a button that says, join our team near the top of the page. So with that, 
I'm going to turn this over and do some introductions to the panelists. You can see on the side of your screen, we have five panelists today. There's Tamika Hughes-Fuete uh, from Go Girl Coaching. And if you're in Green Bay, she was just in an article this weekend that featured her business and her journey. So congratulations, Tamika. Um, these seconds, if you could wave. Um, and then the second speaker will be Kyle Herzog uh, from Old Fashioned Golf, who is also uh, just outside of Green Bay and De Pere. Um, the third speaker is Ann Vandehe uh, from Zepnik Solutions, also in Green Bay. Um, then we go to Jana Morishima uh, at Kids Comics Unite. She's out in New Jersey. Um, and then Brandon Dubay, who's the founder of Idea Hound and has about six other jobs. Um, and he is out in the Virginia, Washington, DC area. So with no, no further ado, I'm going to stop my screen share and turn this over to the speakers and Tamika to start off. Go ahead. All right, so hi, my name is Tamika Hughes-Pate and I am the uh, founder and uh, CEO of Go Girl Life Coaching. And um, this is a, uh, this, uh, speaking of dreams and goals and things like that, this has been a passion of mine for over a year now. And I, and it's just finally launched of May, March of this year. And uh, I am a LLC organization. And basically what I do is I'm a certified and empowered I'm empowerment women life coach. And so I do this through one-on-one -on -one life coaching, workshops, group coaching, and public speaking. But I think the biggest challenge, because it's just me, um, I do have a few volunteer team members that are helping me out now, but I it's just me. And so deciding like which entity was best fit for me. And after having a conversation with my supporters and then, you know, people from S SBA and, you know, and then my uh, business mentor things. And so decided that LLC would be the best uh, fit, um, especially, you know, especially considering that versus that DBA, because one of the things I did discover is that I needed that to open up a business account because I wanted to have that separate and so, and then just trying to like navigate and figure out like, what's the best way to go for me for just being myself and, and me a startup business. And then that's one of the reasons. And then like now the biggest challenge is um, trying to attach a nonprofit <laughs> onto the LLC. Like this is some obstacles and it's a whole nother beast that I'm uh, <laughs> working on you know to like put that on there so those are those are some of the uh biggest uh challenges and um and the reason one of the reasons that i have chose to do this is because of my own personal experience and thing that i've had in life that is you know that has really led me towards to come alongside other women young women young adults as well to help them through their journey of adversity that they go through as women you know been a a single mom with children, you know, at, the, at a very young age, I had my first child at 15 and my second child, 16, third child, 18. So very challenging life. And I just, uh, and, you know, got through it. And I just want to be um, that person for other young women as well. And so you, you can go to that gogirllifecoach.org if you have any questions and click on that little let's talk button and, um, and I can give you more information through there. Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Kyle Herzog. Like Lori said, I am in Green Bay and one of the co-founders of Old Fashioned Golf. Uh, we started in July 2020, so kind of in the midst of COVID, um, very much had some free time on our hands, so decided to start a business with it. We thought that in Wisconsin, there's a couple things that are unusually popular. Golf, which is weird because you can only golf like four months of the year, but it's extremely popular. And just our local pride. Everybody in Wisconsin sure loves Wisconsin. So we thought about combining those two to make a business. Of course, there is some Wisconsin themed golf apparel, but it's all kind of boring. It's a red shirt with a W on it. And that's it. So we, we cranked that up a little bit. You can see by some of those designs there, some license plate themed ideas, something with the Great Lakes. We do some things with the state flag, a lot of things like that. Um, like I said, founded in 2020, founded during a round of golf, we came up with the idea. 
I will say one of the first things we did was talk to Lori and talk to score. I have no entrepreneurial background, no business background. None of us really knew how to get this thing off the ground. So to kind of echo what you said, Lori, people who are getting started, reach out, reach out for help. Score's willing to help. It really helped me get things started. So we make golf polos, towels, hats, new one coming out soon. There you go. Sneak preview. Um, but uh, so we've been doing that since since 2020, like we said, and we are a partnership. So the three co-founders you can see there, all of us lifelong friends, all of us from Wisconsin, and we came up with the idea together. So we formed it as a as a partnership together. And I think like you see on the bottom left there, the partnership has been good for us because really one of the first things there was three of us to share the cost <laughs> to start up. One of the hardest things as you get started is just how are we going to pay for this? And in a partnership, I think it was good that we had three people to put money into this to get started. I think that helped. Um, easy to understand. Really, it's a third of us or a third of it is owned by each of us. Kind of an easy business structure to, to wrap your mind around, I would say. Um, again, like I said, the startup funds were sure nice. We've got seven young kids and three wives between our three co-founders. So it was nice to not have to tell them we had to put a bunch of money into this. So that helped. Uh, more input for ideas. I think that was a big thing. As you're getting started, a partnership's great because you've got three heads to put ideas into things. And checks and balances. You'll have some really bad ideas as you get started. I can speak from experience. And it's nice to have two other people there to kind of check you on that, I would say. So, um, and how has it worked for us real quick on the bottom right there? We still own 100% of the business. It's been great because it's a partnership. We haven't needed outside funding, which has been nice. Those checks and balances have kept us from some really bad decisions. I will say on the downside, lack of experience slows us down at times. We haven't reached out for help and partners and outside funding, which maybe could have made us go faster at times. So that's maybe one of the downsides of partnership. But that's my story. Hello, uh, my name is Ann Vandehei and I am a SCORE mentor as well. Um, also the HR manager and employee owner of Zetnik Solutions. Um, we are located in Green Bay as our corporate headquarters and we also have a second location in Cincinnati. Um, and we're always kind of looking at um, potential new satellite locations. A little bit different, I wasn't here for the start of Zepnik Solutions because we are 22 years old. Um, we are an engineering and equipment automation firm, um, but the owner uh, is looking to hopefully retire soon. <laughs> That's the dream. And he was kind of looking at how do we continue his legacy, basically. Um, you know, he started Zepnik Solutions because he wanted to form a great place to work. Um, and so he doesn't want to sell to, you know, a larger competitor or, you know, just dismantle. So how does he move forward? Um, and at looking at the options, uh, be becoming employee owned allowed us to maintain the culture that we've become accustomed to um, and something that he worked really hard at building. And it also allows him to remain engaged with our company for as long as he decides he wants to be here. Um, at this point, it might take a little longer than anticipated, um, <laughs> but he is here. He is helping with the strategic direction of the company. He is working with our leaders that were kind of rising up to president and vice president um, and just making sure that he gets us set up for success. So um, that's been, you know, an interesting transition um, for kind of a tenured company. Uh, it has helped a lot with um, employee retention and with this labor market, just pulling people in because it is a wealth building tool that you know not a lot of other places can offer um, because we are 100% employee owned. So you know we are the owners. Lastly, you know, with him looking to retire, one of the uh, questions that would come up to us pretty frequently was from our customers and wondering what's happening to the business when he does decide to walk away. So knowing that employees have become the owners and um, just the amount of 
kind of investment and buy-in that employees have when you're employee owned has actually helped strengthen some of those relationships. So um, that's been kind of the gist of all the good stuff. And obviously there are always um, some issues that arise. Uh, one thing is, you know, who really controls the company if you're employee owned? Um, kind of the communication from the get-go uh, is, is what helps foster what that looks like because we still do have kind of a corporate structure where we have a CEO and a president and they are making the main decisions, obviously. Um, but it has made us become a little bit more transparent with how we're making those decisions. Um, it's made us uh, be more open to employee ideas and just kind of increasing our communication in general. We are not perfect at it. It is something that we are working on. Um, it's on the top of my list right now. <laughs> So uh, that has been one of the challenges. Uh, if you were to talk to the owner, he would tell you that if you're an owner looking at this strategy, um, you are not going to walk away with as much money um, in your pocket as if you had sold it outright to another business. It's been an interesting journey that uh, I think will be an ongoing educational piece for me for the uh, upcoming future, for sure. Hi everybody, um, I'm Jana Morishima and I'm the founder of a business called Kids Comics Unite. Okay, so what Kids Comics Unite is, is an online community for artists and writers who create comics for kids and young adults. Um, and this is our homepage, so it kind of gives you a sense of all the different types of things that we do. We do a lot of events, mostly online, but occasionally, as you can see here in person. Um, and I can show you the inside of our community right here, which is hosted on a platform called Mighty Networks, which is very similar to a Facebook group, but it's independent. Um, so that just gives you a really quick preview of what Kids Comics Unite is. Um, it is a public benefit corporation, which, oh my gosh, I can't even remember what month we finally um, incorporated, but it was this year. Um, so Kids Comics Unite actually started at the beginning of 2020, um, but it was a sole proprietorship. So it was like the most basic, simplest non-entity <laughs> that you could possibly be, basically. Um, and so in the beginning of this year, I was very determined to uh, create a real business structure for it. And I did a ton of research. Um, the main reason why I wanted to give it a different business structure than a sole proprietorship is that it became clear to me pretty early on that this thing had a lot of legs. Like it was really, word was spreading about it organically and a lot of people were joining and there was so much energy and enthusiasm. And um, I, I could, all of a sudden I could see a really incredible future for the organization, much beyond what I had originally thought of it as, which is just a simple meetup. Um, and I know now that I don't think I want to always be the person in charge, but I think this organization could be around for a hundred years or more, who knows. Um, so I wanted to put pieces in place so that it could uh, continue and even grow beyond me. Um, so I considered making it a nonprofit, I considered making it a co-op, I considered making it a public benefit corporation. It was a very difficult decision. In the end, the reason why I made it a public benefit corporation is because this would allow me to give equity to team members who are working with me and also potentially down the line to member contributors. Also, I, I really liked the idea of enshrining the mission of the company in the charter of the actual corporation, which is what a public benefit corporation does. So that if for some reason um, down the road, the, another it merged with another organization or something, the, the um, mission statement would be in our corporate charter so nobody can change that. In terms of uh, what a public benefit corporation is, like I said, it's it's that fact that the mission statement is listed in the charter. It's also, um, it has to be transparent because we are required to publish an annual report detailing not just our income, um, but also our, how we've 
um, fulfilled what we've listed in our social charter, which we haven't done yet because we haven't existed for an entire year yet. <laughs> and then the third thing is that as a public benefit corporation, we're not just taking into account our shareholders, we're taking in, into account our stakeholders. So it's a really holistic way of seeing the business and how it, um, you know, all the different entities and people who are involved in the process, not just the people who are running the business, but also the people, the customers essentially are as important um, and, and the partners in the, in the wider industry. I would say that there have been challenges for sure. If I could go back and do things again, I actually might have filed as an LLC and then wait until later to decide on my business entity because I feel like I invested a ton of time and a ton of money in ultimately this formation. I tried really hard to talk to a very well-known lawyer, me, and I did manage to set up a consulting call with him. And over that consulting call, he basically said to me, like, if I, if I could give you advice a little bit late, I would say just do it really simple and focus on product market fit. So that's the final message I want to say. Product market fit, super essential. That's what I'm focusing on right now. I can talk more about it if you want me to later. Um, I think I've said my piece. Yeah, I can, I can talk about my cooperative journey a little bit, uh, kind of following off of uh, Jana's experience. Uh, I'm based in the Virginia, uh, Washington, DC, Maryland, Virginia, we call it the DMV. Uh, I'm, I'm based or, and from that area, but currently living in Richmond, Virginia. I'm part of an organization called Crowdwork, which is a limited cooperative association. Um, and it really just seeks to decentralize work opportunities uh, for local city residents right now. Uh, maybe one day we'll expand other cities. Um, but we, we chose the cooperative route um, after really working with uh, DC government, particularly um, the office of uh, DSLBD uh, or uh, the Department of Small and Local Business Development. I always try to remember what it stands for. Um, and they were trying to incentivize back in like 2015, 2016, a, a bunch of conversations about co-ops. Uh, and that's kind of how I got involved in that conversation. I was very interested in this idea of shared ownership and uh, democratic decision making. Um, and I, I didn't realize that like I had come across co-ops in my daily life. You know, if you've ever shopped at REI or Ace Hardware or land, bought stuff from Land of Lakes, uh, those are all different types of cooperatives. Um, so they're, they're just working structures that uh, emphasize worker ownership. So like the workers have um, more say in kind of how uh, uh, an enterprise is operated. And that was like really appealing to me. Uh, I have like a background in technology um, and I always wanted to you know, find ways to, to help those who are kind of in that field to kind of get their ideas um, more front and center without necessarily going to like a VC uh, or, or some investor and, and kind of having them steal the show. Uh, so like the co-ops are like really cool. Um, maybe in 2018, 2019, I came across this conference called the Platform Co-op Conference that was taking the idea of co-ops to platforms. So a platform might be a, an app you use on your phone, like Uber. Um, so like thinking about, you know, what would Uber be like if the riders, and the drivers uh, owned uh, Uber? Like how would that change how the experiences? Uh, so I was like really inspired by that back then. And I, I tried to create a platform co-op, but it's a lot of work. Uh, and so like we settled on this uh, kind of new phenomenon uh, of the limited cooperative association, which is, uh, you know, it's kind of like the LLC of co-ops. Uh, that's that's kind of how I, I put it. Um, it basically allows you to have different class of uh, classes of shares that can kind of accept if you want investors, like you can have investors, but they won't have decision making authority. Um, and you can just have like member owners. And so like that was most appealing to uh, the group of folks that I was working with. Uh, and we launched in 2020, um, focused on providing technical assistance and educational training to um, you know, local DC area residents, um, 
we had our, our first contract with DC government last year, um, focused on providing continuing education for uh, returning citizens or, or people who were formerly incarcerated and kind of helping them start their own businesses. Uh, and that was a lot of, uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, in the future uh, that we're able to kind of continue that uh, type of work with different communities, uh, helping them, you know, find ways to, to do business. Uh, because I think like in some ways, like con controlling uh, your destiny is also like kind of controlling what you do, you know, and I think business is a good way to do that. Um, and I, I can talk about decent, other decentralized forms of, of organizations later if uh, Lori lets me. I want to thank all of our speakers. I did want to give folks a heads up on what's coming next. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a series on ownership design. Um, and this is the first one, which is kind of the taster Baskin Robbins of ownership design webinar. So thank you all for providing your own special tasty flavors today. Um, we do have three more webinars coming up. The next one is on employee ownership. And as I mentioned, Anne has very graciously uh, offered to join that as well and share a little bit more deeply the story of Zepnik, but also we will have an ESOP a uh, specialist on and another company that is just starting their journey from family business to employee ownership. Um, so that's coming up on the 13th of September. Uh, we will be digging more deeply into cooperative ownership with a co-op uh, startup uh, organization called start.coop, how to accelerate your co-op, um, as well as uh, folks who have or are in the process of starting uh, their own co-op businesses. So that's on September 21st. Um, and then we're going to welcome Brandon back with a few other people to talk about decentralized autonomous organizations, also known as DAOs, um, how those work, um, how you set them up, what is the legal structure? What the heck is a DAO? That is coming up on October 5th. Um, I hope you all are interested and will share uh, these webinars with others. Uh, you can follow us at, at Score Mentors Green Bay on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. So again, thank you to Kyle and Jana and Ann and to Mika um, and Brandon for your time today. And um, everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks a lot.